Okay, we are recording now, and for starters, if you don't mind uh, giving me your name and your spelling of your name, and then the title that we should put on the air. Yeah, sure. I'm Daniel Oran. It's O-R-A-N, his last name. And I'm in the Digital Medicine Group at Scripps Research Translational Institute. Uh, the thing that caught our attention with the, your report was uh, asymptomatic patients with COVID-19. Um, yeah. You know, we, oh, sure. Go ahead. No, uh, your, your research is very interesting. Um, one of, one of the, 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 you know, the things that caught our attention was that if you are asymptomatic, you still may develop long-lasting symptoms. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is very interesting. Um, you know, people think if you're asymptomatic, you're kind of scot-free. You look and you feel fine. Um, there have been a few studies now, three of them, two from Japan, one from South Korea, where they found that when they did CT scans, images of people's lungs, a large fraction of the people, more than half, actually had abnormalities, so these hazy regions they call ground glass opacities in their lungs. And that's concerning. We don't really know the long-term implications of that for people's health, but um, it could be serious. So I think it's a reminder that we're still learning a lot about this disease. It's six months old or, or less. So this is an example of asymptomatic, not necessarily meaning harm-free for people. Interesting. And, and, and you know, uh, what would the effects be that you might notice? I mean, would, it, would that mean coughing for you? Would that mean pain? Uh, what what yeah. would a patient feel? Sure. The interesting thing here is that people really probably won't feel anything at all. Um, these are called subclinical findings, meaning that both the doctor and the patient is really unaware of them until they have the CT scan. So the kind of scary thing here is that these are abnormalities in the lungs that both the patient and the doctor won't be aware of until they have the CT scan. I'm really not sure what the meaning is of these unusual findings in the lung tissue, but potentially it could be something serious. And for us, the puzzling part of the virus, you know, we see these reports come out. Um, your findings show that, you know, we've seen some of the symptoms or heard about some of the symptoms, the no, no taste, no smell, of course, the coughing and the fever and those things. Uh, but are you saying that, uh, you know, almost half of the patients may not show any symptoms at all? Yeah, in our research, we looked at 16 groups around the world, and this was in Iceland, Indiana, um, Italy, a really diverse group. Um, about 40 to 45 percent of the people in, in representative samples, those are ones that really reflect the entire population. Although they were infected, they had no symptoms. Um, so we think that probably is a pretty good estimate for the number of folks who become infected, um, yet are asymptomatic, as they call it, about 40 to 45 percent. At one point, I, I believe it was a, a Chinese report that had said that these e asymptomatic patients may be super carriers. Uh, have you found any truth to that in your research? You know, it's unclear right now how often asymptomatic people actually spread the virus. We know they are capable of spreading the virus, but we really need more data to determine for sure how frequently they actually get other people sick. So if you feel fine, you look fine, you may be infected, and you actually might be able to make other people sick too. But how often it happens, we still need more research to determine for sure. And, and you know, I guess that just reinforces the fact that everybody should be tested, I guess, because you, you just don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in an ideal world, we test every person every day. The, the test would be accurate and inexpensive enough, sort of like a home pregnancy test you could do at home in the morning in three minutes and have the result in 10 or 15 minutes. And we hope over the next three or four months, there will be some tests, maybe not quite that inexpensive, that will be accurate and available in the home. Meantime, though, there are actually interesting possibilities for other kinds of, of surveillance, they call them public health. One possibility is using digital tools like smartwatches and, and Fitbits and actually crowdsourcing, kind of sharing that data with scientists and public health officials so they can spot outbreaks. In fact, here at Scripps, we have a project called the Detect Study, and it's detectstudy.org, where folks can share data from their smartwatch or their, their Fitbit and actually help us try to spot COVID-19 outbreaks using data like resting heart rate and sleep and, and activity data. 
So it's kind of exciting to think about alternatives to traditional testing to try to help us spot and identify people who are ill. Interesting. And, and you know, and from your report, what, what are your walkaways that our viewers should be aware of? Yeah, I think remember that just because you, you look and feel fine, unfortunately, you still might be infected. So I think for the, the safety of others, take precautions. Uh, wear that mask. Um, keep your distance from those outside your household. Avoid crowds. Avoid enclosed spaces. We know these are the sources of infection. There are a number of what they call super spreading events. Um, for example, a choir up in, uh, in Washington State. We're being in an enclosed space, being in a crowd, being close to people, and often speaking or singing or, or shouting. Um, you know, these are, unfortunately, the kind of uh, um, you know, group of, um, or cluster of, of activities that potentially can cause spread. So um, I think the, the additional fact that we now know folks who have no symptoms who are infected actually do have some changes in their lungs um, potentially means there could be serious effects down the road to being asymptomatic. So I think it's all the reason to be cautious. You know, stay calm and, and take the uh, precautions we've all been talking about, but be cautious. Uh, this is a serious disease potentially. And uh, knowing what you know about asymptomatic patients, you know, what are your thoughts as you see our own communities open up and crowds return to bars and beaches and stores? I mean, does that just, you know, <laughs> take you back a bit? Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, I understand uh, we've all been cooped up for a few months and boy, it's been very, very hard to be separated from friends and, and family and, and, and work. Um, but remember, the virus has not changed. The, the virus is just as uh, dangerous as it was a few months ago. So we're lucky here in San Diego to have beautiful uh, beaches and other activities and great bars and restaurants and all. But again, I would say be cautious. Um, you know, take the precautions like wearing a mask when you're outside your home. Um, look, I know it's no fun wearing the mask. Uh, you feel kind of funny, it's uncomfortable. But we know from research, um, I think the most compelling research is with healthcare providers who've been working with coronavirus patients over the last few months. Those who have had access to good masks mostly have not gotten sick, even though they've been up close with the patients. So I think this is great evidence the mask really can be helpful. So wear that mask, try to keep your distance when you can. Um, and remember, the virus uh, you know, is still out there. Something like 97% of us still have no immunity to this virus. I like to use, use the analogy of kind of like a dry forest. And the virus is almost like a, a match. And right now, we're kind of like dry trees, all of us. We're, we're ripe to, uh, to be ignited by a virus we have no immunity to. So be cautious. So, you know, one match uh, in a dry forest leads to a forest fire. A virus in a community with almost no immunity also you know, leads to a pandemic. So um, I think that the message is, um, you know, try to uh, find ways to, uh, to open up and get out again but do it in a cautious way. We're not going to go back to normal for, for a number of months now. Uh, and back to the asymptomatic uh, patients, it, is there any indication for them to know that they have the virus? I mean, there's, there, there's, they're not getting those uh, you know, fevers. They're not getting the cough. They're, yeah. are, are they, they're not getting any of those symptoms? No, no, they're not. Um, you know, it's interesting. Fever turns out to be a very poor predictor for, for COVID-19. There have been hopes that um, if we check for fever, we would find people. But it turns out that um, fever is present in only a small fraction, something like 12 or 15 percent of people who become ill with COVID-19 develop a fever. Um, as for asymptomatic people, um, you know, by definition, they just don't perceive any difference at all in their body. As we were saying, though, when uh, we do research and do a CT scan of their lungs, we do find there are abnormalities in more than half the people. So you know, it could be that some people are just more sensitive to signs in their body. And if they have a slight fever or the resting heart rate is elevated, they might be aware when others aren't. Um, so, but the bottom line for people is you can look and feel fine, but in fact, you still can be infected. And when you're infected, unfortunately, you can make other people sick too. In those, uh, what you've detected in the, the asymptomatic patient's lungs, um, will, you know, the long-term effects there, we, we just don't know yet, or 
Yeah, at this point, unfortunately, we just don't know what the, the long-term effects of these ground glass opacities, they're called, um, on the CT scans might be. Um, it could be nothing or it could be something quite serious. You know, of course, one possibility is that down the road, um, you know, a couple of years later, people who have been affected by COVID-19 today um, have some effect of, of having been affected um, because of potential damage to their lungs. But again, it's unknown at this point. All we know is that the, the large majority of people who are asymptomatic um, do in fact, it appears, um, have these abnormalities in their lungs according to the CT scans. Can you describe those abnormalities a little bit? Are those lesions or growths or how would yeah, you, you know, describe when, when a, a radiologist sees a, a ground glass opacity, they're essentially you know, seeing a, a hazy region on the CT scan. Um, and what that means uh, for certain um, really depends on the specifics of the patient's case. So, um, you know, if the person is uh, um, at risk for cancer, for example, it could indicate uh, something in that category. But it really it depends upon the, the kind of disease that, that is under question. So the, the fact that there are these hazy regions alone doesn't tell us specifically what's wrong. It just tells us there's some kind of abnormality. Um, and just to be clear, I mentioned the example of cancer, but I'm not suggesting that any way that um, you know, people are getting cancer from this. Just an example of when you see this type of finding on an x-ray, or rather on the CT scan, I should say, it just means that there's uncertainty. Something is wrong, but what might be wrong is unknown um, until you know, further studies are done. So you know, the short answer is we see these ground glass opacities in the CT scans, but we don't really know, you know what's going wrong. We don't know what's, what's changed in the lungs whether that's something minor and short term or something potentially significant that has uh, some serious health consequence. Um, as we followed this virus in the spread, you know, they, at first they were saying, oh, the flu is worse. And then they kept comparing it. Are, are you, can you frame up the COVID-19 for us yet? Or do we still need for this to play out quite a bit more? Yeah, I think it's clear now that this is quite a bit more serious than typical seasonal flu. Um, you know, there are uncertainties about the actual infection fatality rate, they call it, which means figuring out the, the total number of people who are infected and then looking at the number of people who, who pass away. Obviously, we have good statistics on the number of fatalities. The problem is understanding the total number of people who are infected. Um, and this is very, very difficult to, uh, to figure out. We'll need good um, serological testing, meaning testing people's blood for antibodies to know eventually what fraction of people truly were infected. That's really will take years to do with great uh, research. So at this point, we know that um, COVID-19 obviously is a lot more serious than the flu. Um, and we know too that the way it's spread might be different from some other diseases in that um, these super spreader events where a small number of people seem to be spreading it to a large number um, is relatively unusual. Um, we're finding that a small number of people, about 20% of, or less, account for about 80% of new cases. In fact, it seems like maybe just 10% of people account for 70% of new cases. And the flip side is about 70% of people who get infected actually seem to get no one else sick. So it's kind of an amazing thing that a small number of people are getting most of the new cases uh, you know, infected. Now, obviously, if we knew who was who, if we could figure out which people were doing the super spreading, who was in that 10 or 20% of people, it would make it a lot easier. But at this point, we have no way of knowing. We don't know whether it's a unique characteristic of the person or of the situation or some combination of the two. Maybe someday we'll, we'll tease that out. But we know in Japan, for example, they spent a lot of time focused on contact tracing and figuring out once someone becomes ill, who they're exposed to, and then going back and trying to figure out previously what the source of their infection was. And by doing that, they've been very focused on trying to eliminate crowds on close contact um, and you know, trying to you know, make sure that people are not in enclosed spaces too. So those three C's they call them, the closed spaces, the crowds, and the close contact, potentially might be a way of, of trying to reduce the spread, and Japan has had great success doing that. Just remarkable, and I, I know there's so much more to go on, but just uh, you know, all the things you reminded us and, and how much we should still be concerned with the spread of this virus. 
I, I really appreciate you talking with us today and, and we'll continue to get out the word. Thank you so much, Doc. Well, great, great to join you. Thanks very much.